Today we're all about taking advantage of the season with an eye on spring, coming up next. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. I don't know about you, but one of the things I enjoy the most about gardening is the planning ahead. There's so many things that we can do in the current season that has an amazing impact on future seasons. So today I thought we'd talk about in the fall garden, what can we do to really make the spring the best it can possibly be? We're gonna visit Canada and take a look at a peat moss bog. I'm also going to show you how you can take care of your knockout roses, give you some tips on roses for smaller gardens. Plus, we're going to Caleb's to see what he's doing to prepare a bed space at his home. I'll also answer a viewer question and we'll learn how to make this delicious recipe. Well, as you can see, we have a lot to cover in today's show, so we have to get started. But first, we have to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to head to Canada. So don't go away. Have you ever wondered how the peat moss we use in our container mixes and gardens is grown and harvested? Well, we took a trip to Canada to find out. Martin Menard is an expert in the field, and he took me out to a bog so I could see harvesting firsthand. Martin, this place is huge. How many acres are in this peat bog? Uh, this, this bog is around 800 acres where we're sitting right now. It's just, it's amazing that we're walking on, on peat moss. How, how deep would the, would the peat be here, potentially? In some area, in this specific bog, we can go up to 30 feet, but that's pretty unusual. 30 feet? Yeah. Good grief. Now, the harvesting system is once you take away the trees and so forth, how do you get the peat moss that we buy at the garden center? I mean, how do you, how do you harvest it, I guess? Uh, the first step in the harvest process is actually arrowing the surface. Uh, we actually uh, lift the peat up so it will be able to, to be dry enough so we can harvest it with the uh, vacuum uh, harvesters. So this harrow is just really throwing it up to dry. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, today we're in very wet conditions, so uh, it's a heavy arrow, so the field will actually dry faster. So when the harvester comes across, which is like a gigantic vacuum cleaner, yes. it's really sort of pulling up the peat moss particles and dust. Almost. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're just harvesting uh, less than a quarter of an inch each time we, we pass on those fields. And uh, for a year, uh, we will harvest between two, two and uh, eight inches, depending on uh, how, how good is the season. And how many days out of the year can you harvest? Because we're pretty far up here in Canada. In this particular location, uh, we're in eastern Quebec, uh, we're talking about maybe 30 days a year. So what, what we have here really is just a, a field of decayed sphagnum moss. Yeah, exactly. This is what we're harvesting for, uh, for mixes and for uh, straight peat. Now, it grows in a bog, which is, um, as we all know, bogs are full of water. And I can see that there's this ditch that runs across. And when we came in here, I saw a series of them. Is this to, to get the water away so you can harvest? Yeah, the first step we're, we do to harvest an area like this, we'll, uh, we'll dig a main trench around the area so the, the top water will get out. We remove the vegetation and then we go to secondary trenching that we can see here and the harvesting area is actually domed so the water will uh, go in the, the ditches as fast as possible. I see, so possible. it sheds off into these long canals. Yes. So Martin, once the, the peat is, is harvested from, from a field or a bog like this, what happens next? Uh, it's going to be uh, piled in a pile of the same grade. So these fields have been graded and then we're going to send it to our plants uh, to be uh, bagged in uh, straight peat or mixes, professional and retail. Generally what we're putting, uh, we can put some composts in, uh, fertilizers, we got some aggregates too. So the uh, the blend will actually uh, help the plant to grow in, in, in gardens. I'm so intrigued with, with mycorrhizae and, and how that's being introduced now into these blends. It's incredible how beneficial a fungus like that can be to the root development of plants. Yeah, actually, and it will also protect them against some root diseases. It will help to get uh, water and uh, fertilizers out of the soil. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty neat. That is very exciting. Well, thanks for the tour and, and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. After the break, I'll show you how to care for your knockout roses, so stay tuned. 
You know, I'm crazy about roses. Roses of all kinds, but I think that any of them that are disease resistant and easy to grow, well, they go right to the top of the list. And that's why I love knockout roses. The other reason is that they work so well with other plants whether I use them in containers or I'm planting them out in the big borders here at the garden home, they just play well with others. I love them with Diamond Frost Euphorbia as well as Ageratum, the Artist Series. And of course, any of the ornamental grasses, they're a perfect combination. Now, what I like also about this particular rose is that it's really cold hardy. So a lot of my friends who live in the north up to zone five, they can enjoy knockout roses in their gardens. Now, a lot of people are afraid to prune. I love to prune because what it means is just more flowers. And what I'm doing out here today is I'm just deadheading. I'm just taking out some of the old flowers and spent buds where the hips are because I want more and more blooms. Just look at all the buds across here. It's really quite fantastic. Now, you won't believe this, but last year, uh, at the end of winter, before the buds began to swell and come out, uh, I cut this particular plant back to, to half its size. It was only about two to two and a half feet tall. I know that sounds very dramatic, but look, it's doubled in size. And the flowers this has produced throughout the growing season, well, you just can't even count them all. Pruning really is pretty simple. Like I said, I just cut these back to about 30 inches tall, and then I went into the interior of the plant and removed any damaged or dead stems. Now every two or three years, I'll go into the center of the plant and remove about one third of some of the old branches to stimulate new fresh growth. Now you don't need to worry about the usual rose pruning cutting back techniques like looking for an outward facing bud. I just lop them off to the desired size. I've even cut my knockout roses back to almost six inches tall. You just can't believe how quickly they flush back with growth. Okay, now take a look here. I've just cut this rose back. We've talked a lot about pruning, but I wanna talk a moment about food and water. After I prune them like this and take out all the dead flowers, you can see lots of new buds coming on already. What I like to do is take a little fertilizer, fertilize around the plant, and then of course water is essential. You want to make sure the soil stays consistently moist and if you'll notice that this large container and it's a large container more soil volume the better it has a saucer under it which helps keep that soil consistently moist three things to remember when growing knockouts give them plenty of sun with air ventilation number two make sure that after you prune you fertilize and number three keep the soil consistently moist and they'll perform beautifully for you your garden is limited in size, selecting plants is always a challenge. Because space is at a premium, you don't want to waste even an inch on plants that don't deliver. You see, I have three requirements for small space plant selections. First, manageable size, low maintenance, and a showy appearance for more than one season. One group of shrubs that meet all of those criteria is drift roses. You see, drift roses are especially suited to small gardens because they have a low spreading habit that reaches about 18 to 24 inches tall and about 24 to 36 inches wide. The collection includes seven varieties. They also meet the other conditions required for being small garden worthy. They bloom from spring through the first frost in the fall, and the gardener gets three seasons of interest as they have attractive glossy foliage. And one of the best reasons to recommend them is that they're virtually maintenance free. These tough roses are disease resistant and cold hardy up to zone four. The only care they require is really six hours of sunlight, consistent moisture, and an application of rose fertilizer after each bloom cycle. In my estimation, drift roses have all the characteristics necessary to earn a place in the small garden. A compact habit, they're easy to care for, and show-stopping color from spring right till fall. After the break, we'll head to Caleb's to see how his garden is coming along, and I'll answer a viewer question, so stay tuned. Purple Sweet Caroline Sweet Potato is a great addition to combination planters because they have a beautiful trailing habit. They're perfect for hanging baskets, but also exceptional as a ground cover. The purple foliage adds instant intrigue whenever it's planted, and it won't take over the garden. With velvety, fan-shaped leaves, that are dark burgundy in color, their shape and color will add a fabulous new dimension to any garden. Caleb Brash is a colleague of mine who's starting a garden with his wife, Caitlin. Let's go over there to see how it's all coming along. Well, Caleb, it's gotten a little cooler since we were out here last. Sure has. <laughs> 
heavens above, but it looks, looks good what you've done here. I like, I like the way the soil's looking, but what I thought we would do today is um, begin to connect the next phase, which is to identify the shape of what this bed will, will look like. And that's what we're doing with the water hose? Yeah, yeah, and so if you're comfortable with uh, sort of the shape of it, roughly, I think this soft curvilinear line will be really nice then uh, I was gonna mark it with some marking paint and then you all can begin scraping off the sod and, and uh, applying what you did here to the rest of it. Yep, right. okay, let me get the paint here and all I do is just kind of start here. I like to just put little dots and then I can connect those dots and make it nice and smooth and then that'll be yet another phase of the landscape. So now we can pull the hose out of the way and you see we have this line you can follow and now I can just connect the dots. So you just follow the line here like this and bring it right around. And it'll be straight head that way. And now <laughs> you can finish stripping out the rest of that turf. <laughs> the fun part. All right. <laughs> Very good. This is gonna look great. Today's viewer question comes from Tina in California. And Tina writes, Alan, I live in California and I love spring flowering bulbs. I need to know how I can get the most out of them in my garden. They seem like they don't last a long time out here. Can you help me? Well, Tina, actually there's some things you need to keep in mind when you're selecting bulbs. If you're after big color, one of the things that I do is I like to blend my bulbs, making sure that if I'm, for instance, planting tulips, that I blend early, mid, and late flowering tulips. That will extend the bloom time almost a month. And I tend to like to mix them in colors of the same color family. This creates a sensational effect. And the same would apply to daffodils. We plant lots of daffodils every year and I love to mix them up. Also, Tina, be generous in the number of bulbs you plant. I like to plant in drifts of at least 15 to 25 bulbs. That's going to give you the most visual impact. Also, you'll want to think about bloom time and the height of the flower itself. You see, I like to plant the earliest flowering and shortest bulbs in front. The mid-season bloomers in the middle, those would be a median height, and then those in the back would be the tallest and they would flower last. Well, Tina, I hope these tips help. Good luck with your project. There's nothing more beautiful than spring flowering bulbs. We need to take one more short break and when we return, I'll meet you in the kitchen, so stay tuned. You know, Ashley, I know I sound like a proud parent, but those sweet potatoes really are beautiful, aren't they? They're gorgeous, absolutely. <laughs> you know, when I think of sweet potatoes, I immediately think of just sort of the classic combination of, uh, of sweet potatoes, brown sugar, some butter, and maybe cinnamon and some spices, sort of that Thanksgiving classic. But, but I see you've got some mustard here. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I think that that combination is classic for a reason. It's delicious. You get the richness of the brown sugar, uh, you know, the texture of the sweet potato, and I always love a little butter with that. Yeah, who, who, <laughs> yeah, who, who can resist butter? Uh, but this is a combination where I think a lot, when I think about food, uh, where acidity can bring it to a different level. Mm -hmm. And so this is, we're adding a little bit of Dijon mustard, and the Dijon has the ability to just spike the flavor a little bit, mm -hmm. give it a little bit, little bit of uh, bite, and a little sharpness, and it's right. got a nice, with the richness of the mustard, has a nice mid-palate balance as so, well. So you get that sweetness from the potato, and then you get that tart, a little bit of tart from the mustard. Yes. Oh, all right, well, let's, let's go after it, yeah. Okay. So, so what's, is, what's first? Well, we're gonna start with uh, just adding some ingredients into the mixer. Yeah, and so we got butter here. This pour. is about a quarter pound of butter. Yeah, all right. And let's do about four tablespoons of brown sugar. All right. And this is a super, Super simple recipe. Three, four, and maybe a little more. Yeah, it never hurts. Great. Okay, and let's do a couple tablespoons of Dijon mustard. And so, what what, what are you thinking um, volume wise? I mean, how many potatoes will this will this? I think you satisfy. Could, depending on how much butter you like on your potato, <laughs> so how, much, right. how much brown sugar you yeah, like. Yeah, how, how much you want them dressed. Absolutely. This this is going to make anywhere from six to eight potatoes, and also, as you can see, the variety of the size of potatoes, but I would say six to eight servings. Six to eight, right, okay, and what, okay. just a pinch? Just a couple pinches of salt, let's okay. do that. All right, there we go. Lovely, all right, and here we go. All right. Great. We'll turn that up maybe just one notch more. So what do you think, Ashley? 
Well, it's been running for about a minute and a half, and I think we look yeah, good. It looks, looks like everything's looks, incorporated. Yeah, looks like um, icing for a cake. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're ready. Okay, great. So let's. Uh, I think the first first thing to do is give a little taste. Make okay. sure we, we like right. where yep. we're at. All right, thank you. Here we go. I think it's wonderful. I'm loving that. And it's got that great balance of salty, sweet. It really does. Sweet. It really does. Mustard. I would have ever thought of that. Yep, absolutely. Very good. Great. You rock. Okay. Well, it's time to take the potatoes out now. That sounds great. Perfect. Right. All right, there we go, my dear. Okay, beautiful. Mm-hmm. All right, so our next uh, step is just going to be to. Okay, so these. so you just bake the sweet potatoes, and yep. it doesn't look like you put any sort of oil on the outside of the skins. No, just just straight up. We've poked a few holes so that uh, as it's baking, yep, doesn't explode. There you go. Right. <laughs> yeah. That that not and, happen. And just how long did you bake them, and at what temperature? Sure, we baked these uh, 350, and they baked for about 50 minutes. We're just gonna we open, open this like guy up, up and uh, and add a spoon of the butter in. A generous spoon of the butter. Yep, and we've got that butter all seasoned up mm. with enough salt and enough sweetness, so no need to, to uh, season the potato at all. That is beautiful. Now you would you would present this in your restaurant um, just like that. Just as is, absolutely beautiful. simple. Exquisite. I don't think it gets any better. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Now remember, anything you've seen in today's show, you can find on my website, pallensmith.com. And pay particular attention to that delicious sweet potato recipe. You're gonna love them. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing Of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't but smile